Uh, my name is Roman Hussar, and uh, I'm a PhD student in neuroscience here at NYU. And uh, welcome to this crash course in neurophysiology. So how does the brain work? Uh, so neurons are the fundamental elements of the nervous system. They are these electrically active cells. So here I'm showing you an image of a neuron that's being poked by this sharp electrode so that we can record electrical activity from the inside of it. So this is kind of what it looks like. So you see that the electrical activity of this neuron is hovering around minus 60 millivolts, and uh, it's pretty stable, but occasionally you see these really sharp punctate events, and these are called spikes. Now, spikes are pretty important, and uh, we really think that that's how the brain communicates. So how does this work? So uh, neurons are also connected. So here, what I'm showing you is the image of two neurons that are being uh, the junction between the two neurons via which these uh, cells can communicate. So that's called a synapse over here. So what I'm showing you here is the this presynaptic neuron that's signaling information through the synapse onto its postsynaptic partner. So that's just some neuroscience lingo for you. Presynaptic, postsynaptic. I'll be repeating it quite a lot. Sorry about that. Um, so we'll again have our sharp lecture and we'll be recording here from this postsynaptic neuron. And uh, this is what the trace looks like. Now what I'd like to point your attention to is that every single time there is a spike here in the presynaptic neuron, we see a membrane deflection in the postsynaptic neuron that will result in a spike. So this is how the signal is propagated through the brain. You have a spike in the presynaptic neuron, and then after that you get a spike in the postsynaptic neuron. Now, what I'd like to point out here is that in this blow-up, you see this membrane deflection in the postsynaptic neuron that's not accompanied by a spike. So not every single presynaptic spike will elicit spiking in the postsynaptic neuron. Now, so that leads to this natural question, well, what would be the optimal presynaptic spiking pattern if we want to discharge this postsynaptic neuron? So for that, I'd like to invite you to consider the, these two connections. So here we have these two neurons, these two blue presynaptic neurons that are signaling to the same postsynaptic partner. And again, we'll be recording with our sharp electrode from this postsynaptic neuron. So let's look at the first connection first. So here in blue, I'm showing you a sequence of spikes from this presynaptic neuron and below in red, the responses of the postsynaptic neuron. Now what I'd like you to appreciate is that here it's really only these first two presynaptic spikes that are effective at driving the postsynaptic neuron. All these other spikes are not really doing anything. So what needs to happen is that this presynaptic neuron needs to be clocking along at a relatively low rate, low frequency, in order to discharge its postsynaptic partner. Now let's look at the other connection. So here it's basically the same story, but quite different because you'll notice that here it's actually the last spikes in that sequence that are effective. So that means that for this presynaptic neuron, you need a lot of spikes in order to effectively drive the postsynaptic neuron. Now, um, so what I'm really trying to get at here is that um, these synapses, these connections, are tuned to different types of inputs. And uh, so, so far what we've been doing is just poking neurons with these sharp electrodes, and all, while that's really nice and insightful, it can't really get at this you know, massive complexity in the brain. Uh, so this is an image, a uh, calcium imaging video of many, many neurons connected within a network doing all sorts of crazy things, and that's, that's kind of the problem that we have. So how do we figure this out? So the lab where I work has recently developed a technique where we can extract information from many, many synapses in the freely moving animal. So that's the preparation that I work with, and here I'd like to show you a, one of the preliminary preliminary plots, observations, that I've had recently. So here, I'm showing you a single connection, and what you have here on the y-axis is the synaptic weight, and on the x-axis, the presynaptic input frequency into that neuron. So it's basically just showing how effective this synapse is for different types of inputs. So you see that there is some kind of structure. And this was performed when the animal was awake in its home cage doing things, now what happens when the animal falls asleep? It's completely different. And this is preserved across many, many connections that I looked at. Now the reason why I find this interesting is because there is this long-standing theory in neuroscience that whatever happens in the waking state when you're going about your life, experiencing the world, then comes to be consolidated and passed into long-term storage in the sleep state when you're asleep in your bed. And that's how we think memories are encoded. And in order to do that, you'd think that the that the tuning or the dynamics of the network that encodes the information when you're awake 
would be preserved in the sleep state so that you could meaningfully consolidate that information. But what I'm showing you here is that things completely different. So that's a puzzle that we don't really, I don't really know what the answer to this is, but that's currently the, the type of question that I'm dealing with. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and for the invitation to talk.